Well, hello and welcome to Solar Alberta's 2023 Solar Series. Today's webinar is called The History of Solar in Alberta. My name is Heather McKenzie and I am the Executive Director of Solar Alberta. Just want to take a minute to acknowledge that I'm hosting you today from Amiskwichi Waskahegan, also known as Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of the Métis Nation. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of many Indigenous peoples, including the Papa Chase, Nehewak or Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot, and Nakota Sioux, nations whose ancestors have cared for and nurtured these lands since time immemorial. We were delighted to have so many people register for this event, and I understand that there are a large contingent of folks also joining us from Nate today. Welcome. Please note that we will be recording this webinar for future distribution. Today, we will be hearing from two informative speakers, Adam Yereniak and Jim Sandercock. They will share their successes and challenges in the solar sector, as well as their hopes for the future of the sector. Following the presentations, there will be a Q&A period in which you can all participate. The entire session will wrap up in an hour and a half. In an effort to increase accessibility to the content we are offering, we have enabled closed captioning for this presentation. You can turn the captioning on in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. During our Q&A period, we're going to use Zoom Q&A for questions rather than the chat box. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section. Also, please click on the little thumbs up symbols to upvote questions that you like. Before we move forward, we're going to do a quick poll to get a sense of who we have joining us today. So please take a minute to answer the question that will be popping up on your screen shortly. All right, there it is. Excellent. So while some people are still doing the poll, I just want to encourage you to also take a minute to pop your name, land acknowledgement and any contact info that you're comfortable sharing in the chat now and throughout the event so that others can look you up on LinkedIn or email you, and hopefully great relationships can begin to be formed. Wonderful. So thank you very much for participating in our poll. I'm just going to have a look at the results here. Okay, so we've got a lot of solar industry professionals here, some solar curious folks as well, a nice split, and some students. I imagine uh, there are actually a lot more students than that at Nate today, but they're not able to participate in the poll. So we're probably a, a good three-way split there. Wonderful. So uh, I'm just going to share a little bit about Solar Alberta before we jump into our presentations. It is actually our 32nd year of operation. We're a nonprofit society that is dedicated to accelerating Alberta's transition to a just and sustainable energy future. We do so by advocating, educating, and serving as an industry and community hub for the solar energy sector. Our membership is made up of over 900 individuals and businesses. In response to the recent moratorium imposed on renewable power plants in Alberta, Solar Alberta has launched an advocacy campaign called Rise Up for Renewables. You can follow the link in the chat now for template letters that you can send to the Premier, Minister, MLAs and local officials asking them to end the moratorium. In addition, we have started distributing lawn signs like the picture that pictured here. Lawn signs are currently available in Calgary, Edmonton, Fort McMurray, Sherwood Park, Cochrane, Fort McLeod, and the list is going on and on. So please visit our website to order your sign. So in addition to this advocacy work, of course, we do provide a number of services, including managing a solar directory and also a request for quote system through our website. In this way, we act as a bridge for installers and suppliers and other solar related businesses to connect with their customers and clients. You can see a screenshot of the directory here on this slide and a link to it in the chat. In addition to our website services, we run a number of educational programs such as this seminar series and a number of in person and online networking events each year. Our next solar series seminar will be held on October 12th and it will be about municipal solar adoption in Alberta. Registration is live now through our website. We're also planning an October networking event in Calgary on October 20th from 4 to 6 p.m. at the Social Beer House 
More information and registration for that can be also found through the chat and on our website. Another exciting event to pop in your calendar is our annual online conference and trade show called The Solar Show. Please save January 29th to February 2nd for our next solar show. Recordings of the last three, as well as our free seminar series are all on our Solar Alberta YouTube channel. In addition to the public education we provide, we also host a number of live online courses of very affordable rates for solar industry professionals or those transitioning into the sector. Classes have started up again this fall on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. And once again, there is a 10% discount for members. Registration for fall courses is now open and our next course contracts for the solar industry starts on October 10th. We are offering $25 off for early bird registrations if you register at least two weeks before the start of the course. And if the dates listed do not work for you, you can alternatively purchase pre-recorded courses and workshops on our website. Lastly, if you're not already, I want to encourage you to join Solar Alberta as a member. We are constantly evolving member services, some of which are included on the screen here. And those are discounts, discounts on our courses and workshops, access to member only content, newsletters and more. Individual membership is just $35 and can be purchased at the link in the chat. If you're a student, I'm pleased to inform you that we are offering a 50% sale, 50% uh, off sale on our student membership until October 6th. So those can currently be purchased for only $10 for the year. If you're looking to support our work at Solar Alberta, please consider volunteering or donating. Links for both of those will be in the chat as well. Alrighty, without further ado, I want to take this opportunity to give a shout out to Lakeland College for sponsoring today's session in particular. And thanks as well to EPCOR for sponsoring this year's seminar series as a whole. We couldn't offer all of this amazing free content without the support of our sponsors. We're always interested in developing more partnerships for our events. So if you or your company want to work with us to educate the public about solar and solar related technologies, please don't hesitate to reach out. Now I'm going to welcome and introduce our speakers for the day. Uh, first, I want to introduce Adam Ureniak. Adam is the COO and co-founder of Kubi Renewable Energy, one of Western Canada's largest solar PV engineering, construction and procurement firms. Adam leads corporate operations and is a principal professional engineer with Kubi Energy. Since 2015, Kubi has installed over 1,500 microgeneration systems in Canada, totaling over 15,000 kilowatts. Kubi Energy works throughout Alberta and BC from offices located in Edmonton, Calgary, and Kamloops. Welcome, Adam, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you today. And secondly, we have Jim Sandercock joining us today as well. Jim is currently a Solar Alberta board uh, director and also the chair of the Alternative Energy Technology Program at NATE. He leads an academic team that delivers industry relevant renewable energy and energy efficiency training in Alberta. He has board experience with the Green Energy Alliance of Alberta, has acted as the co-chair for the workers prototype group with the Energy Futures Lab, was a board member with the Alberta Council for Environmental Education and was a member of the City of Edmonton Energy Transition Leadership Network. In the past, Jim has been involved in a few different partner projects between Nate and Solar Alberta, including co-hosting learning opportunities and research projects. So welcome, Jim and Adam. I'm now going to turn the slide deck and the mic over to Adam to begin the presentations. Hello, thank you very much. Let me share my screen and just confirming that is showing up all right for you. It looks great. Thanks, Adam. Awesome. So, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Adam Urania, co-founder of Kubi Renewable Energy. And uh, yeah, let's jump into it. So at Kubi Energy, we offer a number of services. We are a solar power engineering uh, procurement construction firm. Uh, we also offer EV chargers and energy storage systems. The picture you see behind in the background there is uh, a system we had a role to play in at the Edmonton Convention Center, one of the most stunning building integrated PV systems. We uh, 
you know, we do residential and commercial work. We tend to operate in the micro generation space. So systems that are five megawatts and down, we are uh, core certified uh, Tesla Powerwall installer and have a number of views on Google attesting to our quality and workmanship. Uh, I think the numbers you read out, Heather, might've been a touch outdated in the last couple months. We've uh, since installed a little bit more. So we've done around 2000 installations total, uh, 16 megawatts and over hundred EV chargers. So a uh, very well experienced firm. Before I get into it, I think it's worth just noting a couple of technical terms in case there's people out there who aren't familiar with some of the terminology in solar. So I'll be talking about watts a lot, uh, which is a unit of power, uh, commonly kilowatts, megawatts, gigawatts, and terawatts, uh, scaling up by factors of a thousand each. Dollars per watt, this is how costs are typically measured. This is like dollars per square foot in other industries. Uh, low dollar per watt is more favorable, better bang for your buck. Uh, micro generation, this is a class of systems and it's typically based off of size. So less than five megawatts or less than 5,000 kilowatts will typically be a micro generation uh, customer or micro generation site. And above five megawatts, now we're talking about utility scale projects, the kind of industrial farms that you might see. And these are sometimes, or a portion of these may be referred to as distributed generation, but I'll be calling them microgen and utility scale for this. So where has solar PV gone in Alberta and in Canada? Um, it's a very fast evolving industry. And it started in the, the late 1970s with the first solar PV system installed in Canada. This was in, in Halifax in, in the late 1970s. And it took around 20-ish years for the first system to be installed in Western Canada. And that was in 1995, installed on Gordon Powell's house. Um, prior to that, the... Uh, Solar Energy Society of Alberta formed and has been operating for over 30 years. And a lot of regulations have come into place to make the industry what it is today. It started with the Electric Utilities Act, which laid a lot of legislation for overall uh, utilities in the province. And then in 2008, the microgeneration regulation was included, which provided a easy or simple framework for homeowners and business owners to install solar on their house or business. And then some other key metrics. Uh, we're in January 2017, the first utility scale solar farm was connected. Uh, a couple of years later, there was in August 2017, there was around 2000 micro generation systems in Alberta. So from 1995 to 2017, there went from one system to, to 2000. And, you know, that took, took just over, just over 30 years, or sorry, my fast there, uh, just over 20 years. Uh, and then from 2017 to 2020, so three years later, there was another uh, roughly tripling of the capacity in Alberta. So from 2000 systems to just under 6000 systems, or 80 megawatts AC, so a 3x to 4x increase in three years. Three years later, from August 2020 to 2023, it, uh, it almost tripled again. And in terms of the number of systems, so you can see the micro generation count increase from uh, just under 6,000 to around 15,000 micro generation systems, that is homes or businesses with solar power on them. And you can see the micro generation capacity has doubled in the last three years. So I'll highlight this further in a later slide, but you can see it's quite the exponential increase in capacity. And the last dot I didn't touch on there was the Traverse Solar Project completed in March, 2022. This is the largest 
solar power system in Canada, and it's 465 megawatts AC. So you can see comparing that to the total micro generation in Alberta, that one project is around two to three times as much as all the micro generation systems combined. So that's a rough framework, and now I'm going to turn it over to Jim, who's going to take waiting, over here. Waiting in the wings. Thanks, Adam. So what I wanted to do is go back in the back in time machine and talk a little bit about uh, an industry now that we see as being like, obviously, solar is going to be the, the, the technology alongside wind that's going to take us forward with low carbon uh, solutions for the Alberta grid. But my central point, I guess, for today is that it really was not a foregone conclusion. In 2009, um, solar was not seen as the major solution for our pollution. And uh, there's a number of reasons. We'll be talking a little bit about the cost of solar as we come along. And really the, the solar success that is, has occurred in Alberta is really due to a, a couple of different factors. And we'll be going through these. One is the local, I'll call it moxie, um, the go get it attitude of the people who are really passionate about the technology for our province. Um, we wouldn't have gotten where we are without them, and we really are standing on the shoulders of giants. Another one is that we had some very smart policies, and you'll see we had some programs. They were actually, I know some people talk a lot about, oh, well, we're doing a lot of things to uh, induce more demand in the industry. Um, but actually, the programs were relatively small compared to what other programs were going on for other technology areas at the time. Um, there was a lot of adaptation and a lot of flexibility on business models. And then we saw this really significant uh, decrease in the cost of solar globally as part of the manufacturing system. Uh, go ahead with the next slide. One of the things you might not know is that in the early days in Alberta and most of the world, solar really event really, really, really originally meant solar thermal, which I've got a picture of a solar collector there. Um, and it was way more efficient at converting the light of the sun into some sort of a useful energy source, in this case, thermal. And solar PV, uh, especially in the early days that I'm talking like 70s through to even the 2000s, um, was really... Solar PV making electricity was really for remote applications where any other source of energy would have been even more expensive. So in a really long ago era, 1970s, I think Adam and I, we neither of us was, was 10 yet, um, uh, Photron Canada was providing most of the materials that people would use. That was Ron Laplace. Laplace. Um, 1990s, there's two companies. Uh, David Eggles was uh, one, of the, one of the people that really saw an opportunity with solar, and he created a business that was pretty well a um, solar catalog sort of system where people would order small sets of equipment, um, usually for off-grid applications, and he would send them out to them, and they'd be responsible for installing them. Um, that was Soltech, and then Ken Newell uh, came out with Power Source. Eventually, there was, there was some... Uh, m a activity and sometimes those companies would merge etc and then in the 2000s um kyle kosowski started up eti which eventually was bought out by a german company called conergy and so these were your if you wanted to do solar in those early days these were your major suppliers now, of course now we've got lots of different suppliers um, but th those were those those were the early days and there wasn't a lot of there weren't a lot of options. In fact, I go ahead to head to the next slide. If you're thinking about who did I buy my solar products from or who were the manufacturers, <laughs> surprise, it was Shell, it was British Petroleum, and it was Sharp out of Japan. And at that point, uh, British Petroleum actually changed their name from British Petroleum to Beyond Petroleum. And they were pretty convinced, uh, or at least they were saying they were pretty convincing in their documentation that this was going to be their big future. Um, and then, unfortunately, the uh, Deepwater Horizons disaster happened in the Gulf down by the US and, and Mexico, and British Petroleum had to sell off and liquidate and find a lot of money and stop spending money to try to pay off all of their liabilities due to that, that big disaster. And British Petroleum ceased making solar modules. Go to the next slide. So as was mentioned, Gordon Howell was the very first solar project to be grid tied on a house in all of Western Canada. So west of Toronto, and that was in 1995. 
by the time and and he went on to uh, found Howell Mayhew Engineering, which is a a very significant player. And that that on his house, he, you can see that's the young young version of uh, Gordon. If we go back in time, and his total system was two point three kilowatts. And today that would be actually considered quite small, but at that time that was that was a fortune. And uh, it was actually Edmonton Power, which is now known as uh, there's a Capital Power got split into Capital Power and and Epcor. Um, they actually came to him and said, we, we want to do a study and see how solar does on the Alberta and Edmonton grid. And then in 2001, David Kelly, who eventually was one of the co-founders of Skyfire Energy, he put solar on his house in Calgary. And I think it was, there's only like maybe 10 houses in all of Alberta that actually had any sort of a grid tie. Um, going on and everything else in Alberta was either oil and gas applications, was RVs, or in a few cases were off-grid cabins and things like that. So then if we go forward from 2001 with David Kelly and about 10 houses in all of Alberta having solar on them, if we go forward six years, there's another thing that was ju not just purely solar, it was getting into, uh, go ahead to the next slide, getting into net zero housing. And so uh, CMHC, the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation, I think it stands for, I don't know, alphabet soup, um, came out with a program called Equilibrium. And they wanted to, across Canada, build 12 net zero energy homes. And so uh, Peter Amarongan, you can see him on the left there wearing the red, the red sweater. And uh, the team at um, Habitat Studio were the main builders. And they came up with a plan and did the design. And you can see the plan on the left-hand side that was probably drawn up by Peter. And then the picture on the right-hand side, they're installing that solar at a really steep angle. Um, they built the Riverdale Net Zero Energy Duplex down in the Riverdale area in 2007. And of course, solar was super expensive. I don't know for sure, but it was probably in the five to seven dollars a watt range, uh, maybe, maybe more. And uh, they got some funding from CH CMHC to do this. But what they really needed to do is focus on the envelope and make sure the building envelope was going to be really energy efficient because solar costs so much to bring electricity and heat to the building. They also wanted to have a lot of passive heat heating. You can see a lot of really big windows, but also with eyebrows to keep it from overheating. And then they had a whole bunch of solar thermal. And so those gray panels that are vertical across the front of that building, those are actually all solar thermal. And that's how they did a lot of the heating of the home and how they had their domestic hot water for their hot water for showers and things it was all solar thermal. So you had this very hybridized system and overall Habitat Studio needed 40 different highly specialized individuals because all of these technology areas were different technology plays that usually people did in a solo fashion. So very interdisciplinary project. All right, go, let's go to the next slide then. So what was happening then is there's a whole bunch of advocates that were really excited about these different technologies, sometimes a solo play, sometimes uh, some sort of a hybridized play. And what they really wanted to do is build more acceptance in the province. But there were a few cha challenges around acceptance. One was, would people accept it? Would people be willing to spend the money to have these more efficient homes, actually have solar? But the other challenge was there were rules that were challenging. For example, connecting to the electrical grid meant you had to fill out all the paperwork for like a 200 or 500 or 800 megawatt coal plant. It was the same paperwork. So that was extreme. And eventually we see later that there was actually the microgen regulation that allowed us to burrow through that. And now it's like three pages of paperwork instead of dozens and upon dozens of pages. But the other thing was that permitting was really unclear from from town to town throughout Alberta. So Gordon Howell, um, for a number of reasons, he was getting a lot of people saying, hey, can I come see your home? And there was also this idea of like, let's reach out broader to the broader public than just the you know super eco-friendly folks. Um, and so they, the band of eco enthusiasts put together what's now known as the Eco Solar Home Tours. Um, and they were basically celebrating practical solutions. And to give you a feel for that, we're talking about an older building um, uh, recommendation called R2000, and they were trying to be as efficient as possible in comparison to something like Passive House, though it wasn't, it wasn't quite as, as efficient. And, and some of the very first homes in the EcoSolar Home Tour were, were showing off things like 92% high efficiency furnaces 
where what we were considering to be a big step up compared to what was dominant at the time was like 60% or 70% efficient furnaces and triple pane windows, which was a, for like the early 2000s, that was actually quite a big deal. Um, there's another organization called Climate Change Central. Uh, the CEO was uh, Simon Knight and his company or organization was really trying to lower carbon dioxide in Alberta and their biggest programs, as I said, there's, there's big programs and there are small programs. Their big programs were things like, let's create carbon offset policies. Let's fund carbon capture and sequestration projects. And let's do on-road testing for things like biodiesel and show if it does or does not work in wintertime. But in the midst of that, he was aware of and had conversations with a number of those uh, eco eco enthusiasts about what could be done in Alberta regarding solar, and there wasn't a lot of uptake yet. So in 2009, um, the Alberta Solar Municipal Showcase was 20 demonstration projects with municipalities across Alberta, and every one of those projects was a kilowatt or larger. But a lot of municipalities at the time were like, "Solar? What is that? How does that work? Is it magic? Um, is this made up? Is really looking expensive?" And so Climate Change Central or C3 actually helped these 20 demo projects move forward. And one kilowatt, that was a big project at the time. Like 2009, that was still considered pretty substantial. The really valuable thing that this did is it got it in front of the municipal um, decision makers who were now coming face to face with solar and seeing it wasn't rocket science. It was boosting municipal buy-in and perhaps more importantly it was focusing municipalities on what did they need to do around having some sort of permitting that would actually work and be efficient so again just to really emphasize there's a lot of enthusiasm and that was carrying the day and we're really standing on the shoulders of giants who had that enthusiasm and spent huge amounts of their spare time promoting uh eco solar home tours um uh, eco homes and solar as well um, and there's tons of volunteerism that basically made this stuff move forward. And they were able to use these really small grants and do big things. So then in 2010, if we go to the next slide, NMAX under Gary Holden was the CEO at the time. And a, a number of people eventually were starting to move from C3 over to NMAX, started coming up with programs. And they got some money, about $14 million from CCEMC. Back, we keep changing the names of these things, but back in the day, that was the climate change Oh, shoot, what was it now? Uh, Climate Change Emissions Management Corporation. And they were mostly spending their money, again, on carbon capture and sequestration, big, large-scale utility uh, wind programs, and a few other things. But they had this $14 million that, that NMAX worked with them to unleash on, on so that they could explore different technologies. And again, at this time, solar PV was really expensive. So when NMAX was looking at solutions that could allow people to make power electricity in their own home, maybe sometimes their own heat as well. Um, they were really looking for environmentally friendly solutions. But remember, just a few years later, we were like, oh, you know, it's a really good environmentally friendly solution is a high efficiency furnace. And here in this era, um, a lot of it was in comparison, electricity in comparison to the fact that the Alberta grid was 58% powered by coal generation. And so compared to that, something like a natural gas Stirling engine looked like a really good option. Um, some of the things they were looking at were small wind turbines, like a, a 3.7 kilowatt uh, wind turbine or a 2.5 kilowatt wind turbine that might have a under four meter swept diameter, um, more solar thermal, should we do solar PV? And the challenge then was that there was really high capital costs. And so they were also, in addition to rolling out these small programs, they were also looking at ways that they could deal with the fact that people didn't have the kind of cash available, or not many people had the cash available to drop that much capital to build these things. And so they were looking at, should they have a leasing program? Should they have a low interest loan program? Uh, and at one point they had what was called a preferred contractor model, where they would work with different companies to uh, that were solar contractors, for example, or, or um HVAC contractors to actually install these different pieces of equipment and they would do all the training and they bring all their preferred contractors together to do training and make sure everybody was was up to date on the newest things and be as efficient as possible. 
So it wasn't a sure thing, but by, oh, let's go to the next slide. Um, by 2015, though, we kind of, oh, I need to talk about capacity building. Yeah, I should probably talk about that. Um, there was training, solar specific training happening during this era. Um, IBEW, uh, Guy Shalafo was training lots of people that were part of the solar uh, union in Alberta. Um, solar Alberta, we had Rob Harlan as one of the ex early executive directors came up from from California, it had lots of off-grid solar experience. Eric Smiley was the code genius. Um, Grid works with Randall Benson and Iron and Earth with Liam uh, Hildebrandt created all these really good training programs. But we were seeing that when we did something like a net zero home, um, that you needed all these different technologies brought together. And I mean, at one point we created these programs, 2010 was Lakeland College with Rob. He created a diploma program. The next year we came out with our first diploma program in 2011 at Nate. But we, we had a hard time. There's so many technologies to bring together that were in that sustainability space that at one point we had 30 different instructors in our program uh, because people were like, yeah, I can teach solar thermal, but not solar PV, or I can teach you know geothermal, but not air source heat pump. And so it was a very exciting time. Um, Tim Matthews, uh, had, uh, hats off to him. Um, he was our technologist and he was literally designing and building stuff um, to teach with because it was just such an cutting edge sort of, sort of world. Let's go to the next slide. So then in 2015, I would say this was solar for the win. Um, there was a quasi utility scale project done with the Green Acres Hutterite colony. And I say quasi utility because it, it's often described as being two megawatts, but because of the rules that if you were below a megawatt, you could do a, um, a the regulation to, to do the short form of the paperwork. But if you were over a megawatt, you had to do the full application with all of the requirements that you'd have for something like a, a coal plant, which would be 200 megawatt plant or 500 megawatt plant. And so they actually have two different meters side by side in this, this location, each of them at 990 kilowatts to avoid uh, breaking past that threshold. The other thing was, is this was a fully unsubsidized project. And that was, I think, the turning point or the break breaking point in my mind for Alberta, where all of a sudden solar PV, it was a totally different game. It was a total breakthrough. Let's go to the last sli uh, next slide. This is the cost curve. I talked a little bit about internationally, the cost of the solar module was declining. I don't know if everybody realizes just how extreme that was. Uh, in the early days, in the 70s, when they were inventing these things, the cost was up around $118 a watt. And now today, we're at like, $27, uh, 27 cents a watt for solar modules. Um, and that's just the module that doesn't include all the balance of system and things. So that gives you a bit of a feeling as to why solar broke through. So let's go to the next slide. Why did this happen? Because the big companies and organizations did not think that solar prices were going to drop. In fact, nobody thought that the solar drop, the solar prices would drop as fast as they did. This is an example of solar projections by the International Energy Association, who had a lot of professionals were asking the question, okay, how much solar will get installed in the future? And so the black line is what actually got installed. And all these lines that are colored that are going off to the right are all the projections that IEA had made where they would say, oh, okay, in 2005, we installed a certain amount, but we think in the future, we'll only install the orange line. And then the following year, it would go up. And then be like, okay, well, yeah, but in the future, it'll only be that blue line. And then it would jump and double. Oh, okay, now this other blue line. And it would jump and double. So they had to up estimate their amount of projections, something like 15 times in a row. Like they just, they couldn't get it into their mind that in fact, the solar prices would continue dropping and, and installations would continue going up. So just one more point from me and then I'll pass it back uh, to you, Adam. Uh, just one more slide, uh, one more click if you will. The really important thing to know about solar and why did solar win? Why are batteries drafting in behind solar? Why did wind do well, but not as well as solar is all to do with the industrial learning curve. And the key thing about a learning curve is that certain technologies, every time you double the deployment, their cost comes down by a specific known amount. And the thing that drives learning curves really well is if something is a commodity and you can buy it from any number of different companies and it's essentially the same product, that's a commodity, and that gives the installers, uh, developers, a lot of flexibility. 
The other thing is if you've got something that's manufactured in a, in a factory over and over and over again, that doubling and manufacturing is really efficient. But if you build something like a, a nuclear plant, those are like engineered one-offs. I mean, they, they technically have some similarities, but there's a lot less engineering in a factory setting and a lot more engineering and bespoke engineering for a large project. So that's why um, these projects went out so uh, efficiently. They're also modular. With a solar plant, you're basically doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, so people get better at what they're doing. And as a result of that, PV ended up with a learning curve of about 24%. Every doubling of solar PV deployment dropped the price by 24%. So that is what really drove, at the global level, the cost declines that we had seen. So over to you again, Adam. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so now let's just get into some of those curves, but specifically related to Alberta. Uh, so there's a lot going on here. So if you're a data geek, you're going to love this. And if not, I will try my best to convert it into English. Uh, so what you're looking at here is the number of micro generation systems in Alberta, as well as the total power of those systems in AC capacity. So uh, green line, green axis, blue line, blue axis. Uh, so you can see the exponential growth curve over time, starting from essentially zero and you know a handful of systems in 2009, up to the three orange markers are what I mentioned earlier, where there was around 20 megawatts in 2017. Uh, that crippled to just under 90 megawatts in 2020 uh, ish and then once again doubled in three years to bring us to present day which is around 180 megawatts ac and uh in the 12,000 micro generation systems total so when uh that yellow dot you see that was the first uh utility scale farm um which was a 15 megawatt AC farm in Brooks, Alberta. And, you know, the yellow, the capacity of that is not included on this graph because that yellow dot is a uh, utility scale, whereas this graph is only showing the, the micro generation system. But you can see that one farm basically doubled the amount of solar in the province at the time, uh, which is extremely uh, impressive and significant, and it'll, I'll highlight that further on, uh, just how much utility scale can impact the total percentage of solar in the province. And it's it's worth noting that uh, Kubi Energy was formed there in 2015. So since then, we've been around for about 97% of the PV development in Alberta. So it's really taken off, especially in the last couple of years. And you can see you can see some of this growth in a similar graph, but this is now showing the annual increase in microgeneration systems and the annual increase in TV capacity per year. So it keeps going up and up and up. Um, you can see some of the numbers that are highlighted here in in the last year, there's been around uh, a 33% increase in microgeneration systems in the last year. So that's very impressive growth for, for any industry. Um, and it's really carried on for, for quite some time. Uh, you can see in this graph, there's a few spikes in the graph and I have them highlighted here. There's been a couple of key programs that have been big drivers for the industry. One of them was the Alberta Residential and Commercial Solar Program that ran from around 2017 to 2019. And you can see in that period, the huge spike in, in solar PV development in Alberta, um, massive rush of people who, um, wanted those incentives. I believe at the time it was around uh, 75 cents per watt was the discount. And then more recently, the Greener Homes Grant and Loan Program got announced. So that was in mid-2021, and the loan program uh, followed about a year later. 
So this is the $5,000 grant that's available now and it's still available. And the loan program, similarly $40,000 interest-free loan. So these are federal programs or the Canada Greener Homes Grant and Loan are federal. The uh, Presidential Commercial Solar Program was a provincial one. But you can see when each of these incentives are announced, it's typically followed by a massive spike in PV development. Uh, so just more people are wanting to take advantage of solar. It helps the economics that much more. And it's probably worth noting that uh, uh, Alberta is growing by around 33% per year. Nationally, uh, it's Alberta's leading the country. And just under 80% of all the renewable energy capacity in Alberta in 2022, or sorry, just under 80% of all the capacity in Canada in 2022 came from Alberta. So this is, we are by far the uh, leading province in renewable energy development. That was micro generation. So that was small systems. Uh, now looking at big systems. So the blue line you saw on the previous graph, that's the same blue line uh, on this graph here. So you can see it uh, it's kind of pales in comparison to what the big systems are doing. So utility scale development has taken off in the last three or so years. Uh, you can see Right there in 2015, there was just that little blip, that two, that was, uh, you know, those are the, the biggest projects of the time. They were, you know, pretty groundbreaking and hardly register in terms of the total capacity. Now, two years later, you can see there was a 15 uh, megawatt AC project. That was the one I mentioned. That was the first kind of true utility scale project that was added in Brooks, Alberta. Um, once again, that that rivaled all of the micro generation capacity in in Alberta at the time. And fast forward a few years, utility scale has really taken off from 2020 onwards. There's been a lot of major farms that have been developed. And these range from anywhere from, you know, five megawatts AC all the way up to 465 megawatts AC, which is the Travers solar project that was just completed in uh, in 2022 so the orange line there shows the total cumulative capacity of distributed uh, or of utility scale projects in uh, in alberta and you can see the data only goes to 2022 so in the last year there's been been a few more added so the big farms are a huge huge driver um, of solar pv capacity So it's probably worth noting that this number is, uh, you know, it is a little outdated, but the ASO has reported that there's around 12,000 megawatts of AC under development here in Alberta uh, scheduled for the next next five or so years. Uh, which, for reference, this chart goes up to 1,000 megawatts. So there is 12x what you're seeing on this graph under development right now. So that was that was all related to Alberta. This is this is kind of zooming out a little bit and uh, looking at looking at Canada as a whole. So you can see the it's increasing every year as expected. Um, and the blue line is the average annual growth. So we're growing. The industry is growing right now by around uh, forty percent per year in Canada. Um, based on installed capacity. So national solar energy is growing by, um, in 2022, that number was around uh, 28%. And like I said, most of that is coming from Alberta. 80% of all the renewable energy capacity in 2022 came from Alberta. So just a very impressive statistic for development and business in Alberta. Zooming out a little bit more, this is the growth of solar PV worldwide. So similar trend, 
um, it is absolutely taking off across the world. Uh, globally, it's growing at around 35% a year. So Canada is outpacing the world slightly and most likely going to uh, increase as time goes on and more development happens. Uh, and this is a fun fact from, from Gordon Howell. He said, it took mankind 68 years to install the first trillion watts, that is one terawatt of PV. And this happened in April, 2022. And it's going to take two to three years to install the next trillion watts. So this just speaks to the uh, exponential growth curve of solar in Canada and the world. So within Alberta, uh, where does our electricity come from? So in 2022, most of our generation came from natural gas. It was just under three quarters from natural gas. So the total generation was just under 90,000 gigawatt hours. And you can see coal was around 12%. Uh, and this is massively successful. I'll highlight this on a later slide, but it wasn't too long ago, as Jim mentioned, where coal was generating 50, 60, 70% of Alberta's energy, electric energy. You can see the slices of green there. That's our renewable energy capacity mix currently, or I guess in 2022. So you can see wind is the biggest, biggest slice of the pie. So wind generates just under 10% of the annual electric energy in Alberta and solar generates around 1%. Once again, that 1% doesn't seem that impressive right now, but you got to put it in the context of, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, it was 0%. So the fact that it's grown to be 1% and is continuing to grow exponentially is, is a huge, hugely positive sign. Um, and this is annual electricity it's it's worth noting that you know solar does really well in the summer and not so good in the winter obviously uh, so on sunny days during the year uh, solar energy currently can generate roughly 10 percent of alberta's daily electricity uh, on sunny days sunny days or sunny hours so where are we going with this it's important history is important to be able to understand uh, where we can take the future. So in, in 2030, what's our energy mix going to look like? Uh, so as you know, coal is phased out. So that black slice of the pie is completely gone. Uh, our, our generation is going to increase. So this is actually a bigger pie compared to the last slide. Natural gas is still going to be the dominant player. It's still going to generate around 70-ish percent. And other renewables are going to increase uh, steadily biogas and, and hydro have been fairly steady over the last 10 years so there's not as much development going on in those spaces but wind and solar are going to be huge drivers uh, in the future so solar is is going to catch up to wind and possibly surpass it in the next in the next seven or so years so right now solar is around you know one to two thousand and we're projecting it needs to get up to around 16,000 megawatts AC, roughly, to generate the 30% of renewable electricity or electricity from renewables in Alberta that the government has mandated. Keep in mind, these are rough estimates only. Um, I'll be the first to admit that my ability to predict the future is spotty at best, but this is a, a rough outline of where solar PV is going. So the amount of solar in the queue for development right now, that uh, you know, that 12,000 megawatts I mentioned earlier, it'll get us most of the way to this target. Uh, so we're already on pace to hit our 20 or 30% by 2030 target. And in 2030, you know, similar to what was just mentioned right now, solar is 1% of our annual electricity, but on any given day it can cover around 10% of the daily electricity. Similarly, when solar is at 16%-ish of the energy mix, there'll be days or weeks or months where it could possibly cover 100% of 
value of the electricity needs. Uh, scrap that on months. It would just be uh, days or hours where it could cover 100%. Obviously, at nighttime, you need uh, other sources of energy. So this is what I kind of highlighted earlier, and it doesn't relate to solar energy, but it's worth noting because it's such a massively successful statistic in terms of uh, carbon emission reduction. Uh, so, you know, 30, 30, 40 years ago, the heavy majority of electricity in Alberta came from coal, 80%, 90% in the 90s, and then gradually tapered off as more natural gas came online, more wind came online, and then the uh, the coal phase out by 2030, uh, that was announced in 2015 from the NDP government and followed by a sharp decline. Uh, but once again, as you can see, it's largely market driven. Lots of natural gas was just coming online at the time. And similarly, you can see the renewable energy mix increasing and that's steadily going up. And one thing to note is that in 2022, the, uh, the amount of renewable energy generation outpaced uh, the amount of coal electricity for the first time in Alberta's history. So that was uh, another big, big turning point in terms of how Alberta's electricity is generated. So we'll be fully, we'll actually be fully transitioned off coal probably sometime in 2024-ish. Overall, that is the uh, history of uh, solar in Alberta that I had. Uh, so I did want to uh, cite a couple of data sources that where all this came from and give special thanks to Gordon Howell for providing the graphs and also being such a early industry pioneer. His, his work early on was instrumental to, to setting up what we now have as the solar industry in Alberta. So thank you very much for everyone listening and I'll turn it back over to you, Heather. Wonderful, thank you, Adam. If you wanna turn your screen share off and Jim, if you wanna come back on the screen, we'll get started with our Q&A. Just a reminder to everybody to please put questions directly in the Q&A box in the bottom toolbar rather than in the chat. I'm only going to be pulling from the Q&A box because it's too difficult to look at both at the same time. Uh, you are also encouraged to upvote questions that you like uh, and pull them to the top of the screen. While folks are entering their questions, I did see one question coming on in the um, chat that didn't make I don't think it made its way over to the Q&A yet but I just wanted to share my screen momentarily because I saw a question about the impact of the moratorium and I know that we've looked at the distant history but we didn't really get a chance to look at some of this recent history so I just pulled this graph together now and uh, what you can see here is the impact of the moratorium on the plans for growth of solar in Alberta so you can see here all the projects that Adam was talking about, the big solar farms that were planned in Alberta. That line of those projects in the queue was just going up and up and up. <laughs> Ever since I started at Solar Alberta, it only went up. And then in July of this year, uh, it reached a high and then the moratorium was announced and it started going down for the first time since I started here three years ago. So that is an indication of the impact of the moratorium in Alberta. What you're seeing is investor confidence has been shaken and some folks are pulling their projects and their money from the province. And so uh, for folks wondering about the very recent history in the last two months, I'm just going to leave that there for you and we'll push that out in our upcoming newsletter. Uh, but I don't want to detract from our presenters today with the very recent history. So I wanted to get that out of the way right up front because uh, I know that we could probably spend the whole Q&A just talking about the last two months alone and uh, we would miss out on 20 30 years so i'm going to stop sharing my screen now and jump over to the q a where we can dig into the history a little bit more because uh, this has been really interesting and thank you for sharing i was actually thinking every solar alberta board member and staff person is going to have to watch this presentation uh, <laughs> when they get started here so godfrey is wondering uh, why do we call them microgens uh, micro generation arrays in alberta is that an international term uh, or is it just made up in Alberta? 
um, he was thinking that the smallest system might be called rooftop systems. And so if you could just maybe elaborate on where that term came from and whether we were we the inventors of the term microgen or is that a, a, a term you might hear in BC and elsewhere? That's a good question. I don't know exactly where that term came from. Um, I would place a bet that Gordon had something to do with it when the microgeneration regulation was being written, but it's probably worth noting that uh, rooftop uh, wouldn't be as accurate because lots of microgeneration systems are mounted on ground mounted systems. Uh, so I, I can't comment on exactly where that term came from, but uh, there's similar terms in other provinces. I know in BC, it's uh, it's called uh, net metering is the the class over here, but they're all similar terms in, in different provinces. Uh, maybe Jim has more insight into the exact history of the word, but I'm not 100% sure. I do not, in fact, have exact knowledge. I know that Alberta does tend to come up with interesting uh, different terminology than other locations, but I'm not actually sure in this particular case. Well, that's a good question, and we'll have to dig into it more. I know that I always find it interesting because there's like small scale microgenerators that are under 150 kilowatt and then there's large scale microgenerators which almost seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> You're like how are you large and micro at the same time? <laughs> but Alberta in Alberta you can be large and micro at the same time. So, uh it's it's interesting and it would be cur I would be curious as well to see what that looks like uh around the world. Um, and then the, the follow up question Godfrey had was uh, and residential is that something under uh, 10 kilowatts so uh, maybe could you just spend a minute explaining the difference between residential and commercial um, and and uh, is there any size limitation or difference. Uh, for sure yeah so residential commercial isn't isn't classified um, in in the microgen regulation what is what is is the the small and large so that is. Uh, smaller than 150 kilowatts or greater than 150 kilowatts for instance we've done houses that are 20 kilowatts and we've done businesses that are 10 kilowatts so sometimes you can have a house that's bigger than a uh, commercial system uh, and there is no minimum uh, you can have you know one kilowatt all the way up to five megawatt uh, micro generation systems mm -hmm. So when you hear commercial or residential, it's really just about who owns the system and not really about the system itself, hey? Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Josh is wondering, okay, microgen systems per capita in Alberta, I think capita probably, uh, lag behind many G20 jurisdictions. What type of policy changes would assist to increase DER penetration and, and for the benefit of the audience and myself, I'm just going to ask if you guys can uh, can spell out all these acronyms for us. Um, the question was, should we just rely on market forces uh, decreasing LCOE for PV uh, or are there other uh, types of policy changes uh, you would suggest to catch up with some of the other G20 jurisdictions? Why don't I take a crack at this one, give Adam a chance to, to have a coffee. Um... I would say that the, the real challenge in front of us is that we've got a really significant carbon problem globally. So what we definitely want to do is move faster. Absolutely. Um, there, there are some interesting things when you compare the United States and then you compare Canada to a lot of other places. So the, the cost of installing solar in Australia is way cheaper than in, than in the United States. Um, you know that the, the Canadian dollar can buy less, but when it comes to solar, we've got some efficiencies that exist in Canada in comparison to the United States. So you're probably buying, even though our dollar buys less bread or coffee or cars or whatever, in terms of that price parity, um, that that our, our solar prices in Canada and the United States do tend to be about the same, both residentially and and for utility scale and, and larger what most people, most jurisdictions would call commercial. So there's definitely room for improvement in terms of some of those costs. And, and some of those costs, and we talked a little bit about it before, is that municipalities and their permitting actually was 
historically a big problem for Alberta. It's a lot more streamlined now today, but there's quite a few jurisdictions still in, in Alberta that the permitting is not a very fast or a simple process. And that, that could be definitely streamlined in, in many cases and maybe even harmonized um, across the different municipalities because you know, for a solar installer, a lot of time is gonna be spent trying to do the paperwork and uh, if every if every, every town, village, and, and city has a different setup, that's that's going to slow you down too. Um, there's also a certain amount of economy of scale. Obviously, a, a jurisdiction that's doing tons of solar is going to have more economies of, economies of scale. And I would say Alberta probably is is benefiting from that right now uh, because of the amount of activity we have. So we are probably already benefiting from that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, you mentioned the different jurisdictions and we do actually offer a course on working with Alberta's wire providers because we have so many and everywhere you go, it's a little bit different. And so uh, it gets confusing, especially for companies as they grow and they're moving from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, suddenly how they have to learn a whole new system, uh, which are all based on the microgen reg, but they're, they're, they have their own little interpretations as well. Um, Adam, did you want to add to that? And I, I'll uh, turn the mic to you for suggested changes. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, Alberta is outpacing the, the country and, and the world just in how much solar PV is being added right now. So I'm not, I'm not familiar with the per capita statistics, but I would imagine that it's just a matter of time before uh, the rapid scale of what we're doing in Alberta uh, surpasses those numbers. Yeah, at this point, it sounds like the rest of Canada is sort of slowing us down on the microgen front. Uh, and they probably need to look at Alberta and think about what's happening here. <laughs> and then that could catch us up globally, I think. Um, it's interesting, we're actually advocating Solar Alberta for a change to the microgen regulation as well, though, uh, hoping to remove the cap on uh, residential systems. So uh, smaller systems, uh, we're thinking if, if they could um, produce, you know, as much as their roof or their uh, ground mount could allow, that might uh, help us to accelerate some of the solar adoption um, from a residential and commercial perspective too. So you can check the yeah. ad advocate section on our website uh, for a little bit of information about that microgeneration regulation piece. Um, but that's a long time coming. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. it's our and dream right now. Heather, if you don't mind me adding, I think, I think one of the challenges we see in terms of like there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and um, not every house is going to be able to be producing its its amount of electricity from solar um, just because of siting or bigger buildings south of them and shading and things like that. So despite the fact that the, the Microgen Act provided a certain structure and a, a, an acceleration and a, an ease of application, I think the time is coming where the big challenge really is about how much carbon dioxide do we put in the atmosphere? And if we can have some residential and commercial um, owners actually being net positive where they're making extra low carbon electricity and putting that onto the grid. That's what the atmosphere needs. That's what climate really needs is for some people to be able to be net positive. Um, how, how you work that out from a, a policy perspective is interesting, but um, really what we need to do is, is, is crack that nut and make up for some folks who just unfortunately don't have the capacity. Maybe they're in an apartment building and they just don't have a lot of surface area to put a big solar plant in. So yeah, we've got some, uh, we've got some work to do to keep up with the chemistry of the atmosphere. Yeah, it's interesting because I know that the UCP recently put the moratorium on on large solar farms, uh, but interestingly enough, just a couple years ago, they actually allowed industrial uh, uh, producers to actually overproduce. So industrial folks in Alberta are allowed to actually um, put an unlimited amount of solar on the grid right now. And so um, so that's, I would argue, a step in the right direction. <laughs> and if we could get there with residential, that would help a lot for folks who uh, can't produce on their own sites, for sure. We're also seeing uh, increasing uh, community generation in Alberta, and hopefully more and more folks will start using the small scale generation regulation to enable that. Um, and we have actually an invest in solar section on our website now. It's new because there are a couple of community generators 
who are taking investments for folks who don't have a roof that's appropriate for solar, like you were saying, Jim, or maybe you've already maxed out your roof and you're looking for, for other, other people's roofs or fields to, um, to generate on. So now there are some options like that developing. And we're actually hoping the government of Alberta will join us at the solar show this year to explain how to use the small scale generation regulation, uh, which was created after the ones that you were chatting about, but is supposed to help us get there. Um, folks are having trouble figuring out how to use it right now and uh, having trouble overcoming the costs associated with using it. But theoretically, that regulation, if we can tweak it, should should help us uh, start to match some of the other jurisdictions around the around the world. I know there are places around the world that that do allow micro generators to um, sort of overproduce, as you were saying, Jim, or maximize their production. And uh, we would be the first in Canada to allow that if we if we start moving on that front. Uh, so definitely an interesting question. Um, I see Ashwin here is the one who had the question that I, I noted, which is what is the current situation since there has been a temporary halt on getting approval. So I, I did show the graph uh, demonstrating that uh, the planned sort of the planned uh, power plants in Alberta, those renewable plants that are in the queue, so to speak, and waiting on approval, uh, that has declined since the moratorium. So folks are taking their investment um, and their plans elsewhere. Um, but I guess I was wondering before I move on from that question, if the two of you had anything you wanted to add on the, uh, the current situation um, since the halt. Shouldn't presume to be the only one to talk to that. Yeah. I would say from from an educator's perspective, um, I'll put my educator hat on. Um, there are risks within this this realm, and and we've seen programs come and programs go. And 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 Adam had a really great graph that he had shared uh, from Gordon that shows, and he he overlaid on there when different programs came along and what happened to the rate of growth. And it, when a program went away, the rate of growth slowed down for a bit before it could could recover. Um, and we've seen this before, and so. I mean, a lot of the post-secondaries, that's one of the reasons we want to be very interdisciplinary in our training, because these things do come and go and it can disrupt industry. Industry, obviously, and homeowners want to have certainty, uh, long-term certainty. So um, for us to make sure that our alumni actually aren't going to be finding, finding themselves unemployed, we, we really want it to be very broad in what we teach, not just solar, but into some of the other technology areas too. Mm hmm. Thanks, Jim. And I know, Adam, that you your business is very focused on micro generators. So um, the moratorium, of course, does not impact micro generators. But did you want to comment a bit more on that? Yeah, correct. We we operate in the uh, five megawatts and down space, but it's just overall a, a very unfortunate policy. Uh, you know, that was that was put in place and uh, something that's anti-business and anti-investment in the province. You can see it from your graph, the amount of uh, the amount of projects in the queue has declined for the first time and putting you know billions of dollars in potential investment at risk. It's uh, just very unfortunate policy and I'm hopeful that it ends as soon as possible and we can get investment in solar uh, operating at full steam again. Yeah, certainly unexpected, I think, for all of us to see any Alberta government compromise individual land owner rights. So that was <laughs> a bit of a shocker. Didn't uh, didn't see that coming, but uh, we'll we'll deal with that as best we can. Uh, Josh is wondering for roofs with limited real estate, um, hybrid panels, PV and thermal seem like a great solution. 19% PV, 70% thermal. Are there any successful examples in Alberta's climate? Uh, for example, Kubi installs. Uh, of this type of hybrid uh, setup and does complexity outweigh efficiency gains? I'll let you start with that, Adam, and then you can touch on that as well, Jim. We, we don't do solar thermal systems. We stick to PV, but uh, you know more technology is going to be developed like the solar shingles that can really maximize the space on the roofs, but um, it's a new technology and it's still a few years away probably from from being brought into Canada. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but solar PV likes the cold, whereas solar thermal is not as friendly to the cold. Is that correct? Uh, solar PV definitely likes the cold. Uh, electricity runs more efficiently at cold temperatures. 
Mm -hmm. So for Northern Alberta, the solar PV would probably be your best bang for your buck. That's probably why we're seeing so much uh, uptake in solar PV. I have to admit, um, the the number of Solar Alberta members who are just doing exclusively solar PV is is huge. Um, probably because that's where the market and is and the efficiencies are at in Alberta right now. But Jim, did you have anything to add on that? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know too too much about the technology, um, and so I I you know I'd only be guessing to respond. So sadly. No worries. That's all good. Um, all right. Alan says, really like the gross generation slides. However, do we have any time of day analysis that looks at some of the advantages and challenges with renewable time of day generation versus time of day grid load? Um, yeah. Do you folks want to touch on that? I know everyone's always wondering about these curves and whatnot. So, uh, feel free to uh, chime in on that. Uh, yeah, I don't have time of day grid load information off the top of my head here, but uh, you know, I, I did mention it that right now on any given sunny hour, solar can produce around 10% of the grid load. Um, as we go forward, that's going to increase all the way up to 100% for, for any given hour. Um, mm -hmm. So naturally, there's going to be lots of challenges associated with that, and that's where uh, ASO and the AUC come in to balance all of the different generators that are on on online at any given moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't think anyone in the solar sector is kidding themselves and thinking that we're going to somehow run the grid at night. <laughs> we're we're well aware the sun doesn't shine in the middle of the night. I think uh, you'll see most Solar Alberta members are also starting to learn about how to do battery installs. We actually have a course on that. Um, I think we're all well aware that with solar must come storage and with solar must come wind and with sol solar must come interconnection to other jurisdictions and all that reliability, uh, all those reliability factors. So um, you won't find any, uh, any jokesters here, but Jim, anything to add to that? I, I, yeah, I would say that um, we know that some of the windiest parts of Alberta, for example, if we think about wind, um, they all kind of spool up, they all kind of get windy at the same time. Um, and so there's actually now some significant wind farms being built outside of the windiest corridor because of there is a financial hit when all of the deep south wind farms spool up together because the wind is blowing through they actually start doing what's called and, and i think your questioner probably knows this but um start cannibalizing the price because they're putting so much solar so much uh, sorry electricity onto the grid that the pool price actually slumps and in the middle of the day of course um, you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of solar generation. And in the middle of the day, there's a fair significant demand in the middle of the day. Um, but it probably is that the, the amount of solar electrical generation is going to be pretty high and it's going to start causing the, the bid price for electricity to start slumping as well. So there's a certain amount of cannibalization that is, is already happening for solar, but it's not, it's not to the point where it's not useful, uh, not to the point where you're not getting your, your money for your investment back or anything like that. I think, I think Heather, your real point was really, really good. Um, you were talking about how people are starting to look at, at batteries and there are jurisdictions that are far ahead of Alberta. Like there's no surprise solutions here. Um, we're, we can probably get to 90% electrification without fossil fuels um, with the technologies we've got today. It's just a matter of deploy, deploy, deploy. And we'll probably find that last 10% solution in say by 2050, that's 2070, that's that's kind of far away. I think we'll, we'll come up with a few things by then. A lot of people get really focused on that 10%. What do we do about the last 10% and get like stuck analysis paralysis, but we just need to start deploying. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the other thing is we, we actually have a really gigantic battery uh, just to the west of us called British Columbia with a huge amount of hydro resource. And so that really gets into a question of how do different jurisdictions uh, interact with each other, especially when they have different models for how they, they do run their electrical systems. But the electricity is there. And BC has been selling electricity down the West Coast into other jurisdictions for, for a really long time. So it's probably just a matter of uh, boosting our interconnection to make up for some of those ups and downs. And then in the middle of summer, when we have huge amounts of solar generation, that could really benefit BC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just have to play nice in the sandbox with our uh, our other part provinces, don't we? I think that um, when I looked at the queue, uh, when the moratorium was first announced, 30% of the solar farms that were planned did have battery integrated 
into them from the get go. And so uh, storage is something that is starting to become the norm. And I have talked to some large wind developers as well who say that they don't put any wind farms in place without storage these days. So um, I think we're going to see that coupling increase. And, and like you say, it's just a matter of deploying it and, and reassuring everyone that uh, we, we can uh, get along with other jurisdictions and we can also use technologies that are complementary to each other. So, uh, so very much appreciate your responses to that. Um, question around how students uh, can get involved in solar in general. I know for Solar Alberta, students are of course welcome to volunteer with us at any time. We do actually take uh, CSL students from the U of A program. We also have capstone students from the U of C that we're hoping to bring in. Um, but of course, we're not doing projects ourselves here at Solar Alberta. We're just promoting everyone else's projects. So I guess if you two could also comment on how students can get involved in solar in general and actual installs, I think that's probably where this question was leading. Should I go first? Okay, Adam. Um, I would say um, you could, uh, I mean, most most uh, companies that would be doing a solar, would be doing solar are, are looking for people who have some degree of training already. Um, that's, you know, as, as the post-secondaries of Alberta are looking to support industry, and that's a really big mandate for us. Um, we're trying to create the training that, that people really need. And so um, our, our organ, um, different programs at Nate, for example, have PACs, their uh, program advisory councils made up of people from industry that are actually hiring people. And they help us identify what the, the trends and um, the skills are that are really, really needed. Um, I would say that you could uh, go and become an electrician. That would be a really good route. And then during your your uh, blue book hours, you're, when, you're, when you're doing your actual work, see if you can find your way into a solar company to be be working with them and that would give you a huge uh, opportunity to learn about installing solar um, when you're getting into the design space um, installations too but especially into the design space and the integration space um, going to a diploma program something like what we have at nate and what they have at lakeland college and at norquest would be a really good call because you'll you'll learn a lot more about how things come together and get a different base basis for how you do the design work um, and then if you were already an electrician and looking for a way to get into the industry, then there's lots of uh, um, trainers that'll, Solar Alberta is a trainer, Gridworks is a trainer, and there's a number of others um, that can give you just that, that make up that gap in your skill set uh, to be doing more of the DC work, um, more of the generation rather than load side uh, work that would be really valuable. So I think there's a lot of good entry points uh, from my perspective as a, as a trainer. Yeah, and I, it is important to realize that there is one regulation in Alberta that does state that thou shalt have an electrician, <laughs> you know, pull, yeah. pull pull the permit for a solar array. So, you know, you do need electricians in the mix. And if you're not one yourself, you either need to get yourself an electrician or you need to actually be willing to become one. Adam, I've seen some of our companies are actually willing to just like pay folks as entry level solar installers while training them on site to become an electrician. So that seems pretty cool. Is that something that you've seen happening where where companies are essentially making electricians out of entry level you know, employees? Absolutely, we, we indenture a lot of new people every year, people that wanna get their electrician ticket. Uh, they, you know, they're maybe have a past career, they're just starting out. Uh, we would start that process, get them their blue book and work under one of our many journeyman and master electricians. Um, beyond that, though, I'll say there's a lot more to solar than just the installers. Uh, there's uh, a huge sales division, there's marketing, there's administration, there's project management, there's design, there's engineering, there's a very broad skill set that's needed. So if you're a student and you're you know, not currently in the NATE alternative energy program or an electrician and, you know, maybe those two aren't in your future then, uh, but you do want to work in the solar industry. There's certainly room for you. And if you want to level up your skills in different ways, then the courses at Solar Alberta are an excellent way just to uh, gain that little bit of extra knowledge, uh, show that you're passionate about solar, show that you're taking the initiative to learn a little bit more. And uh, that's always a huge huge thing we look for on on a resume is people who are interested in solar and backing it up with some sort of even if it seems like minor education course it it does go a long way so when we're 
when we're looking for people, which is pretty much always, uh, that's, uh, that's a key thing we look for is people that are passionate about solar who want to be in the industry. I have noticed your company appear pretty much every week on our solar jobs roundup. So if anyone is watching for solar jobs, uh, we do actually push those out on social media every Wednesday. We have volunteers who go through all of our members websites, pull all the jobs they can and push them out at the public so that hopefully you can see what types of jobs are, are out there and then what types of training you need for those jobs, if any. So uh, you'll, you'll get a sense for, for that on our social media feeds for sure. Um, and Heather, I should put mm -hmm. a shout out also to um, Student Energy. It's a homegrown organization um, out of U uh, of C and U of A that has now grown to be in across globally, um, something like 60 or more chapters. And so if you're a student right now in one of the major post-secondaries in Alberta, there's probably a chapter that you could become a member of and uh, chat with like-minded people. And it could be a, a whole smorgasbord of people who are in engineering and in HR and in other forms of business and accounting, et cetera, working together. And there's some really cool projects that they're now starting to make available uh, to their, their member chapters around the world. Wonderful, wonderful. It's so exciting to hear about all the different opportunities. Um, Justin here is wondering, what role should solar advocates have in building land use and planning so as to ensure that new buildings in the province have predominantly south, east, or west facing roofs to ensure that surface areas can be used for PV? Justin, I feel like I planted you in the audience today. I, I promise I didn't, um, but thank you for asking because Solar Alberta has actually put together some tools specifically for that on our website and hopefully Mackenzie can pop some links in the chat while I'm chatting here. We have two tools for you to use to advocate. One is our solar ready home checklist and it is a checklist. So we took a CANRIA, the National Association and ENERCAN, the federal uh, body and National Research Canada, I think is or National Resource Canada. Uh, they put together a solar PV guidebook and it is it's very industry heavy so it's it's got solar thermal and pv and it's thick and it's not fun to read uh, so of course adam and jim probably know that document backwards and forwards because they're into not fun stuff but we took it and then we distilled it into like 10 of the most simple principles that you should be asking if you're shopping for a home or if you're talking to city councillors or if you're basically trying to encourage your city to uh, regulate more um, solar ready homes. And uh, it's also just a tool for consumers so that, yeah, if they're out and about, they can ask the right questions. Because I don't want anyone out there making the mistake I did and buying a home with a garage that can't handle three pounds per square foot because it is extremely irritating to not be able to put solar on my garage without having to spend two to $3,000 to better enforce the roof. So I don't want you to fall into that situation. So we have the solar ready a checklist on our website. And then we also spend a whole bunch of time putting together solar ready uh, guidelines or recommendations rather for municipalities that you can advocate for. We have them on our website as well and that we are really hoping the AUC considers having a look at these as well because we talk about basically um, what you should consider when siting solar on rooftops but also more importantly uh, when siting solar farms and how you shouldn't encroach on the best farmland or if you are going to be on farmland you should consider agrivoltaics where it combines solar and and uh and livestock or other food production so take a look at those tools um they're meant for you to be able to advocate with and to become more informed with and so uh thank you again for your question justin jim adam anything you wanted to add on what role solar advocates can have uh, in basically making our municipalities, our province more solar friendly. I'd say um, talk to your councillors. So your city and town and Reeve or whatever councillors are going to be making decisions. They've got a lot on their plate and having somebody come and talk to them and say, hey, I'm really excited about this. Have you seen this? Can we talk about this? You're either going to find somebody who is really excited as well, or you're going to find somebody who's like, yeah, tell me more about that. I don't know enough. So yeah people who are willing to talk to your city councillors and or mayors, um, that's really critical. And those resources like Heather just outlined will set you up and print off a copy for them too. Yeah, great point. Adam? I don't know if I could do a better job than the resource booklet that uh, Solar Alberta put together, but um, all all codes and policies are based on input from, from industry and constituents. So 
if you if something needs to change then then make it known to the appropriate governing body or or you know code writing committee um what mm -hmm. needs to change uh, especially governments governments should listen to their constituents so at all levels uh you know municipal provincial federal uh right to the powers that be that uh you feel that something is important Yes, and our partner, uh, MCCAC, the Municipal Climate Change Action Centre, also put together a solar-friendly municipalities guidebook that we find very helpful, uh, and you can definitely refer that to your city councillors. And um, one final note on that front, the new city charter that's in place for Calgary and Edmonton, it does allow Calgary and Edmonton, it explicitly states they can create bylaws with respect to energy efficiency in the built environment. So cities like Calgary and Edmonton do have more power there than other municipalities in Alberta. We're hoping, and one of our advocacy points right now is that the province will enable municipalities all over Alberta to have some power to regulate and create bylaws with respect to building efficiency. Um, but right now the two big cities do have that power, although they are reticent to use it. I'm hoping they will this fall though, I hear there are some discussions in place about EV and solar ready homes here in Edmonton and hopefully Calgary as well. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, the top question is one we already touched on. So I'm just gonna go down to Floriel. Oh, this is a... <laughs> This is not a question, this is more of a comfort, and I appreciate that. So coming from France, I can tell you this moratorium will not be the end. I already experienced this back in Europe. PV industry will win. Thank you so much. I really think we all needed to hear that today. Um, it's really hard to watch all those growth curves that Adam showed us and then to see them tapering off right now. But uh, it's it's good to hear that we will uh, live to fight another day and we're not done yet. <laughs> and certainly on the microgen front, we have not slowed down at all. So um, I appreciate that, Florio. I'll ask one more question here. We've got Bahi. I'm wondering whether Solar Alberta manufactures the PVs locally or import it, and to know whether they export PVs internationally. Furthermore, are investors welcomed by Solar Alberta? So this is a Solar Alberta question, so I'm going to take a stab at that. But you will notice on the timeline that we went through that manufacturing was not even a blip on the timeline. So this is not just an Alberta anomaly, but there is no solar PV manufacturing in Alberta. And it is questionable whether there ever will be. <laughs> that is just not our area of strength. We're really good at installing it. Um, and so what we have here are distributors. We have distributors uh, who distribute the products that are manufactured elsewhere in the world. And I think Jim touched on a couple of the, the old, old era distributors and uh, the new ones are listed in our directory at solaralberta.ca. So we don't have manufacturers locally. We do have distributors. Check them out on our website. Um, furthermore, our investors welcomed. Investors are in on our website. It'll say um, you can find the link that says to invest in solar. And we have two members right now that are receiving investments for solar in Alberta, and hopefully more and more as the weeks and months go on. Um, so you're certainly welcome to invest in some of our members, and we're always happy to have more members who are looking for investments. So thank you for that question, Bari. All right, I think that's all we have time for today because I wanted time to give a big, big thanks, of course, to Jim and Adam for their wonderful participation and presentations. Uh, I've learned a lot and I've already been in this sector for three years, but I still learned a lot. So thank you for that. And of course, to all of you for attending to Lakeland and Epcor for sponsoring today. Really appreciate the teamwork here and everybody chipping in uh, for a wonderful so seminar. 